Are we good? Uh, that sounds better. All right. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming back to this panel on uh, our first of two panels this afternoon, um, discussing the consumer welfare standard as it has come to be established in recent decades of uh, agency practice and uh, federal court jurisprudence. And we're going to hear four presentations on this panel on different alternatives or different ways of thinking about the consumer welfare standard going forward. This is a huge panel because in addition to the four very distinguished panel uh, presenters that we have, uh, we have an equally distinguished group of commentators who will come up and join us uh, after these four uh, presenters have spoken. Uh, my principal job, given that we have two hours and uh, nine presentations, will be to keep and enforce time, uh, which I will do ruthlessly. Um, so. Uh, with no further ado, let me introduce our four speakers. It will go in the order um, uh, uh, that they are that they are seated. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Barry Lynn. Barry Lynn is president of the Open Markets Institute, um, uh, which he initiated uh, after 15 years of running similar policy programs at the New America Foundation. Uh, after that will be uh, Jonathan Sallet of the Benton Foundation. Uh, we'll, who will be followed by Maurice Stuckey, professor of law at the University of Tennessee, and finally, Tim Wu uh, from Columbia University. I don't think any of these panelists need much uh, further introduction, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Barry. Thank you, Howard. Um, I mean, one thing, I'm actually not the president of Open Markets, I'm just a director. Um, we're, as you guys who know us know, we're a pretty uh, flat organization. Um, uh, thank you all. It's uh, a great honor to be here today. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Simons for organizing this exceptionally important discussion. The extreme and growing concentration of power in America poses many political and economic challenges. And the FTC was created precisely to deal with such problems. I believe my testimony from a hearing in the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee last December has been distributed to my fellow panelists. Uh, the following comments build on the historical analysis of the consumer welfare philosophy that I provided in that document. Uh, today, I want to emphasize six main points. First. The prime purpose of anti-monopoly law is to protect the liberties of the individual citizen and our democracy. You know, I'll start with a quote from one of the founders of this institution, Woodrow Wilson. America was created, he said in 1912, to break every kind of monopoly and to set men free upon a footing of equality, upon a footing of opportunity. Let me buttress that with a quote from a man who rejected Wilson as a leader due to Wilson's racism, yet fully embraced Wilson's vision of America. This is W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote in 1935, America's contribution to the modern age is a vision of democratic self-government, the domination of political life by the intelligent decision of free and self-sustaining men. Isn't that a beautiful description? of the American nation, the domination of political life by the intelligent decision of free and self-sustaining men. The election in 1912 began the modern era in, in antitrust. Over the first 14 months in power, President Wilson, in tandem with Congress, passed the Clayton Antitrust Act, the Federal Reserve Act, an anti-monopoly tariff reform, a progressive income tax, the FTC Act, and the key principles of this regime because it was, in fact, a coherent intellectual and legal regime, the key principles were the main practical goal of anti-monopoly is to extend checks and balances into the political economy. The foremost goal is not and must never be efficiency. 
Markets are made. They don't exist in any platonic ether. The making of markets is a political and moral act. Corporations are tools of governance. They must be regulated, preferably through competition. Vital monopolies, such as communication and transportation networks, must treat every producer and buyer the same. They must never discriminate. The worker, farmer, independent entrepreneur, and professional must be free to form unions, cooperatives, and associations. The founders of modern anti-monopolism did not see anti-monopoly as one policy among many. They saw anti-monopoly as the operating code that governs every commercial relationship between citizen and citizen everywhere. They saw it as the way to make and protect a political economy that not only allowed but encouraged, and I repeat, the domination of political life by the intelligent decision of free and self-sustaining men. The vision worked. As other industrial nations fell to fascism and totalitarianism, in America it resulted in the most powerful, richest, freest, most materially and socially innovative nation ever in the history of the world. My second point today, the authors of the consumer welfare philosophy aim to promote concentration of power and top-down systems of corporate control. As most of you know, Robert Bork in his book, The Antitrust Paradox, provided the key intellectual argument in favor of the consumer welfare philosophy. Bork aimed to simplify anti-monopoly to one goal only, efficiency. Exactly what traditional anti-American monopolism, I mean American anti-monopolism, must said was never be the primary goal. The effects of this change were understood at the time. In 1987, the former chairman of this institution, Robert Potosky, in Congress said of Mr. Bork and his work, underlying all of his thinking is a fundamental disdain for the competence of Congress and the Supreme Court to understand economics and apply its principles. His appointment would threaten the delicate balance among the legislative, executive, and judicial branches that is the heart of the American Constitution, constitutional system. We would see a different sort of country of companies in every segment of this economy were permitted to merge down to two or three giants without fear of antitrust exposure. My third point today, the effects were indeed radical and extremely dangerous. The political and economic effects of this change in thinking and policy are many and increasingly terrifying. Monopolists are key drivers of inequality, suppressing wages, ratcheting up prices. Monopolists use their wealth and power to disrupt and dominate our democracy. Monopolists sell out our national security, making us depend unnecessarily for vital supplies on autocratic regimes such as China. Monopolists make complex industrial and financial systems more subject to catastrophic cascading failure. Monopolists kill people by driving up the price of drugs and vaccines, of medical supplies and hospital beds. Monopolists impose increasingly autocratic systems of control over workers. Platform monopolists exploit their chokehold control over our communication systems to strip our free press of ad revenue and to make influential authors, reporters, editors, publishers afraid to speak their minds in public. The manipulation machines of these platform monopolists serve also as the main conduit for the subversive propaganda and misinformation, both foreign and domestic, now tearing our nation apart. Fourth. We must return to basics. The consumer welfare test must go. I know this discussion is deeply frustrating to many of you. You've devoted entire careers to this philosophy. I greatly appreciate how much creativity so many of you are devoting to stretching the consumer welfare philosophy to fit all sorts of new purposes. But the word consumer itself, the concept itself, must go. There are many problems with the concept. I'll give you two. It inverts the main original purpose of anti-monopoly law, which was to protect us as producers, creators of goods, crops, services, ideas, art. It leads us naturally to focus on material measurements of well-being rather than the political goals that prevent and keep citizens alert to concentrations of power, the maintenance of liberty, the protection of democracy. My fifth point today. Traditional, the traditional philosophy of anti-monopoly was simpler 
more predictable, and easier to enforce. Many people criticize us for not detailing how to make our vision of anti-monopoly work. They say we aim to use anti-monopoly to specifically address all sorts of social and political ills. Frankly, at open markets, we don't see any need to come up with anything truly new at all. We believe the anti-monopoly regime as originally designed fully promotes these values of liberty and democracy. Hence, we do not believe that specific, any specific legal decision should ever require CEOs or judges to assess those values. As a stopgap measure, we would simply return, could be tomorrow, to the basic principles stated in previous guidelines for anti-merger and anti-monopoly enforcement. Those guidelines are simple. They're easy to understand and use. Consider complex industrial activities. Thanks to rules limiting one corporation to no more than 25% of any market, every CEO and every enforcer need to be able to count only as high as four. Add to those 1968-era antitrust guidelines, the guidelines then enforce at the FCC, USDA, Federal Reserve, DOD, STB, and CAB, and all the rest of the U.S. government, and we'd have today's monopoly crisis licked faster than you can say the word Google. Sixth and last, the founders of the modern anti-monopoly regime understood consumerism as a pretext for and a pathway to autocracy. I began with Wilson. I will end with the other great founder of this institution, Louis Brandeis. Some of you have heard me read this quote before. This is for the record, so I will repeat myself. Americans should be under no illusions as to the value or effect of price cutting. It has been the most potent weapon of monopoly, a means of killing the small rival to which the great trusts have resorted most frequently. It is so simple, so effective. Far-seeing and organized capital secures by this means the cooperation of the short-sighted, unorganized consumer to his own undoing. Thoughtless or weak, the consumer yields to the temptation of trifling immediate gain and selling his birthright for a mess of pottage becomes himself an instrument of monopoly. Today's monopoly crisis is, in many respects, more grave than any we have faced in our long history together. We will overcome it, we, as we have all the crises, crises before now, together. I look forward to working with all of you to reestablish America on a firm footing of liberty and democracy, one that this time perhaps will be forever unshakable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. I'll turn it over now to John Salad. So Barry and I didn't coordinate. There was no joint conduct here, but I'm going to pick up where he left talking about Louis Brandeis. I'm going to do that because I think there are two really important questions that we're going to discuss in the course of the afternoon. One is, what's the role, if any, of larger social democratic, even political concerns in antitrust? Second, is the enforcement of antitrust best pursued through the use of the consumer welfare standard? Now, I want to look at these questions through the prism of Brandeis, who, as everybody knows, Barry just illustrated, was a leading advocate for stronger antitrust laws in the early part of the 20th century. He wrote a book called The Curse of Bigness. Gives you an idea of his views, right? He viewed, he viewed monopolies and trusts as inimical to democracy, to individual opportunity, to economic opportunity. And by the way, he viewed opportunity in democracy and opportunity in the economy as closely linked. What I want to take a few minutes to talk about today is what I think are two fundamental teachings from Brandeis that I think have borne the test of time. One, as to the question about politics, the democratic, and social goals, I think he teaches us how Congress, the legislative branch, or state legislators, can consider larger social and democratic goals in the formation of antitrust while keeping antitrust enforcement and litigation free from day-to-day -day political concerns. So an institutional distinction. Secondly, I think he teaches us how we can look to the idea of any competitive process as a measure of what antitrust laws protect. So I want to do this by going through 
five principles that demonstrate what I believe was Brandeis's view of progressive governance of antitrust and competition, but tells us when the right question is directed to the right institution. First, he thought, he thought monopolies and trusts were very dangerous. He thought legislators, Congress, should consider those democratic goals, the questions of political power. He thought should be considered by Congress. Why? Because he thought Congress can consider whatever it wants. And that was his first principle. Congress should look broadly. But secondly, and this is just as important, he thought the job of Congress was to translate those concerns into enforceable legal standards that identify harmful industrial, that was his word, we would say economic, industrial conduct in a manner that vindicates the values. So we know a lot about what Brandeis thought about how legislation should be written from what happened in May of, 2000, uh, May of 1911. On a Monday, the Supreme Court decided Standard Oil. For progressives, that was a defeat. He thought, Brandeis thought that was harmful to the Sherman Act, that it gave judges too much discretion in deciding what was or was not violative of the Sherman Act. He got a telegram from Senator La Follette saying, can you come to DC? He telegrammed back, I'm going to take the night train from Boston. He did Wednesday night. By Thursday of that week, he was here working on legislation to reform the Sherman Act. And so we know what he thought about how to proceed. We know he didn't put into that proposed legislation anything like, let's look at the political power of an institution, what are its lobbying resources, what he did put into it was some very important measures that he thought focused on economic outcomes of monopoly. He looked at, well, here was some language he wrote into the legislation to prohibit unfair or oppressive methods of competition, not that far from the current standard of Section 5. He looked at issues like exclusive dealing or tying or market allocation. He proposed presumptions, rebuttable presumptions, for market share and horizontal, and even he proposed a presumption to deal with input foreclosure and vertical mergers. He talked about when the burden of proof should be on the defendant. In other words, he thought this kind of legal standard could vindicate larger goals without having to litigate them. And that meant he looked next at what antitrust enforcers and courts should do. He thought they should follow Congress's instruction. And it's very important here to understand the history. The history is his views were affected mightily by Lochner versus New York, right? Different case, labor laws, Constitution. But he thought that case, remember what Justice Holmes said in his dissent about the Constitution not embodying Herbert Spencer's social statics, right? He thought that decision demonstrated a court that was willing to use its theory in place of litigated facts. He thought that was backwards. He wanted antitrust to focus on what was really going on. So whereas he told Congress to look big, he told antitrust enforcers to look very granularly at the facts in front of him. He wanted to know were markets working or not working. When he criticized Dr. Miles, the decision that was overturned by Legion, he said, he criticized the Supreme Court for lack of familiarity with the facts of business life, which he said results in erroneous decisions. In other words, he preferred the hard work of detailed inquiry to the easier path of theory that he thought the Lochner Court uh, exemplified. He thought the right laws would lead to the right investigations, which would lead to the right results, because he wanted antitrust to work. And so he, wanted, he thought facts matter. He did not want to get caught up in abstractions and formalisms. He wanted to understand the practical lessons of economics. Now, he also understood that everything about competition law does not come from antitrust, right? He, for example, he did not want antitrust to set prices. He didn't think that was the job of antitrust. But he recognized that there could be sectoral regulation. In his day, railroad regulation may have been the leading example, where that kind of more intense look was appropriate. And so he favored sectoral regulation where he thought it was justified narrower in scope, but more detailed and expansive in its reach than antitrust laws. And here he distinguished, therefore, between the tools that government has 
in enforcing and promoting competition. Fifth, he, he really emphasized the importance of innovation. He, he emphasized it in industrial circumstances, but he also emphasized it with specific regard to the creation of the Federal Trade Commission. He wrote an opinion, a dissenting opinion, in 1925 in a case called FTC versus Gratz, We he talked about the FTC, Section 5, as being important, well, imp why would one have a phrase as general as unfair methods of competition? Two reasons, he said. One, we looked at incipiency, actions that haven't yet had the kind of competitive effect that he thought the Sherman Act examined. Secondly, because he said, there will be new kinds of harm that we can't anticipate. If we write a detailed list, we're going to miss some. And so he wanted a standard that would evolve as economic issues as the facts evolved. He believed the FTC was important because he thought data was important, <coughs> like these hearings demonstrate, the importance of an expert agency gathering information. He thought the FTC was important because its expertise was important, because it could pick up the work of what was earlier had been the Bureau of, Co of Corporations and bring to bear real learning and experiment in how to proceed as, for example, uh, with potential rulemaking, which Commissioner Schopert talked about. Let me just go to the second question briefly, because it's an irony that 100 years ago, Brandeis handed down his most famous antitrust opinion, Chicago Board of Trade, which ruled against the government enforcement action, with this language that everybody had, well, I think Tim quoted earlier in the day, perhaps. But uh, what I want to talk about is the facts. The facts of this case is there were public trading between grain buyers in Chicago and farmers located in the rural Midwest. And what he worried about was asymmetry of information, lack of transparent markets, the inability of farmers to bargain effectively when they wouldn't have actual knowledge of market conditions. Now, this decision has been much criticized, I think sometimes with hindsight. But what I think is critical here was he was defending a rule, a limitation of trading hours, that went to the idea of establishing what he thought would be a competitive process. Didn't mandate any outcome, but it did permit bargaining to take place among people who, bo who all had information. My last point. There's going to be more talk about the competitive process as we go on uh, this afternoon. I want to just emphasize, as this quote from the United States government's brief in the Amex case emphasizes that it is an approach that is already recognized. After talking about the consumer welfare standard, the United States government said, consistent with the Sherman Act's fundamental policy of market competition, courts protect consumers by protecting the competitive process. And that's important because as a litigator, I can tell you that it can be confusing when one is litigating a case that is not about sellers dealing with consumers. And those cases exist. They exist in monopsony, right, when there's huge buyer power affecting upstream sellers. And by the way, there might be no reduction in output to consumers. They, can, they come about in intermediate purchaser cases, like the Cisco US Foods case, where a restaurant was harmed, standing between a supplier and its consumers. In late 2006, the Justice Department brought a case that had to do with cable TV in uh, Los Angeles that Macon Delarim recently described and quoted as alleging that the joint conduct, quote, deprived LA area Dodgers fans of a competitive process. Now, just one aside, Howard, if I could. I'm a Red Sox fan, okay? The World Series is competition on the merits. I just want everybody to be clear. On but the point is, we have a way of thinking without getting confused about the role of the consumer in circumstances where harm is focused on other players in the marketplace. And I think, as a litigator, that is an effective, useful way of focusing courts on what they should focus upon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now to actually um, 
against this backdrop to give us uh, one vision of what an alternative to the consumer welfare standard might look like, uh, Maurice will talk to us about the effective competition oh. standard. And that is what we're going to do. We're going to go forward today. All right. <laughs> so first, I want to talk to you a little bit about why do we need a new standard. So one thing that we – thank you very much for this opportunity. So one thing that we've seen is the decline in enforcement outside of cartels. First, we see the decline in monopolization cases. DOJ brought its last predation case in 1999. Uh, between um, 2000 and today, the DOJ has brought only one Section 2 case. Um, in contrast, the DOJ between 1970 and 72 brought 39 civil cases and three criminal cases against monopolies and oligopolies. John Kuwaka has pointed out the significant decline in merger enforcement in concentrated industries with an HHI below 3,000. There is a significant decline by the agencies in prosecuting vertical restraints. And we can say that it's not that we've reached the point of optimal deterrence. The DOJ is still prosecuting a lot of um, per se cases, and we look to see what's going on in Europe. And there may be multiple contributing factors, and I want to point out two. One of them is the consumer welfare standard, and then the next is the rule of um, reason. So <clears throat> what's some of the problems? And Marshall um, Steinbaum and I have um, outlined this in our latest report. And first, there's no well-accepted definition of consumer welfare. And it means different things to different people. And you look at the ICN surveys, that bears it out. It also raises significant rule of law concerns. So one, you know, the, the U.S. courts say that the reduction of competition does not invoke the Sherman Act until it harms consumer welfare. So how much competition can be reduced before it starts affecting welfare? One of the problems with this is that there's no uniform definition of who the consumer is. Some people say, no, 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 you got it all wrong. The consumer welfare standard includes workers, it includes sellers, it includes everyone within the distribution um, um, chain. But the reality is, as we all know, is that the competition officials generally look down. They don't look up. They don't look up to see what the effect of a merger is on workers. They don't generally look up to see issues of buyer power and the like. Even if we can agree on consumer, there's no uniform accepted definition of welfare. And here, what we find is that welfare is not synonymous with surplus. In fact, looking at prices can lead you to the wrong result with these dataopolis. So Facebook acquires WhatsApp, they reduce price, is that necessarily a good thing? Not necessarily if they are going to significantly reduce privacy um, protection. And even if we can identify who the consumers are and what welfare we're concerned with, trying to then measure the impact that a restraint has on that welfare can be very, very uh, difficult, particularly with these data dataopolies that ostensibly charge a zero price and reap their monopoly power through data that they collect through us. So one thing we hear is, well, the consumer welfare standard provides predictability and objectivity. That's really questionable. And it's particularly questionable when you look at, for example, group boycotts, elimination of nascent competitive threats, and the like. So the ICN says, you know, trying to determine the impact on consumer welfare engenders a relatively high degree of uncertainty in estimation or assumption used for quantification of detriment to consumer welfare. The other problem is we have had a natural experiment now for 35 years, and it does not appear that the consumer welfare standard is much about consumers, nor necessarily has helped improve their welfare. Instead, what we are hearing increasingly is that the United States has a market power problem. And Marshall has done some excellent work on this involving um, labor. We also cite some recent studies that show this market power problem. So where does that lead us? We have an unwieldy rule of reason type of analysis, and we have a consumer welfare standard that's largely vacuous. So 
What we propose here is the effective competition standard. And what we propose is actually not very radical. So first, preservation of competitive market structures. We already heard from Jonathan that that's in the law. And in fact, as Jonathan pointed out, that's where the Obama administration was starting to go towards the end of its administration. And you can see this in the case law as well. The protection of individuals, purchasers, consumers, and producers, that's also not controversial. I really doubt that anyone in this room today would say that anti-competitive restraints only matter if they affect us as a consumer and not as a worker or as a seller in today's market. Preserve opportunities for competitors. That's a fundamental value of competition law. And that is especially important when today's economy where we're dealing with powerful platforms. And this is uncontroverted. If you look at the Supreme Court, time over time, they talk about protecting firms' right of freedom to trade. Promoting individual autonomy and well-being. Here, one of the fundamental beliefs for competition and competition policy is that it can promote an inclusive economy that promotes overall important values such as autonomy and overall well-being. I mean, you just think about Topco and comparing competition law to the Magna Carta in terms of promoting um, economic freedom. And this is, again, very, very important with respect to labor markets. Next, disperse private power. What we've learned is that economic power can often translate into political power. And the goal here is to ensure an inclusive economy that promotes a healthy democracy. And that's what you heard from Barry in his comments. So how would it change then the status quo? And here, one of the key things is all you would need to show is a substantial lessening of competition. You wouldn't then have to show, well, how does that substantial lessening of competition affect consumers' welfare per se? And one of the key takeaways that I hope you get from my, my, um, my talk today is that today we have the worst of, both, of all possible worlds. I think it's beyond dispute that competition encompasses multiple economic, social, moral, and political goals. Some of you might say, no, it just encompasses one economic goal. But even among you, you cannot agree among yourselves that economic goal as narrowly to prevent trade-offs and the like. If you have multiple economic goals, you cannot also have an open-ended, rule of reason type of inquiry. What you require, then, are those multiple goals to be synthesized into legal presumptions that are administrable for the agencies and are simple enough for the lawyers to explain to their client. And here, what we propose are seven areas of legislative change. And they're all in greater detail in our um, paper. I'll just run through some of them. For mergers, we have already have now a bill to switch the presumption. We just add um, a couple fine-tuning to that. And I think this will give then greater accountability, particularly when the agencies allow these mergers to occur in highly concentrated industries or mergers where the acquiring firm is a monopoly. Market power, one of the things that you might hear from the rest of today, and I think when we talk during lunch, which is one of the worst um, <laughs> Supreme Court decisions, Amex came up. Because there are multiple ways you can prove market power. And what we identify is both direct evidence as well as circumstantial evidence. And one of the key points here is depressing quality, including privacy protection below competitive levels, can be indicia of significant market power. <coughs> That turns next to looking beyond price effects. Everyone agrees on this. I mean, there's no real dispute that antitrust looks beyond price. The problem, though, is, is that price is what we invariably gravitate back to. I mean, that's why unilateral effects theory is so popular today, because it's quantifiable. Coordinated effects, much less so. 
And this is not going to really help us. The price-centric tools that the agencies have are not going to help us in the data-driven economy where things are often for free. And the Europeans now are starting to move forward on this. And I think there's a greater gap between what the Europeans are doing and what we're doing with respect to this. Behavioral discrimination, basically getting us to buy things that we don't really want at the um, highest price that um, 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 we're willing to pay. That and section one, section two, and duty to deal are all suggestions, and we'd love to pursue this during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Maurice. Um, Tim, to you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I, uh, I'm pleased to be, I'm not quite at the FTC, but in the orbit of the FTC again. It's, uh, it's uh, wonderful. I want to uh, say that I have a, um, a transcript available of this, uh, or uh, of this, uh, uh, not quite a transcript, a, a, a written version of my testimony that I will uh, make available uh, on the web. So here's what I, I want to talk about. Um, uh, my, my talk's structured really in two parts. Uh, first, I want to describe what I see as the major problems with the consumer welfare standard. And then second, I want to talk about how, uh, in practice, the uh, protection of uh, competitive process uh, standard works. Uh, it's a leading alternative. So here is uh, what I think. Um, you know, I think the good faith version, the honest, uh, earnest effort to use a, a consumer welfare standard uh, is, uh, has been at times worthy. Uh, it is an incredibly ambitious uh, idea, uh, idea to bring a certain scientific certainty uh, to the law of uh, antitrust. Uh, but I think that uh, some 40 years into the experiment or so, uh, we have to admit it has not succeeded, um, that uh, it has indeed failed, and uh, that uh, it has run into repeatedly uh, the limits of the legal system. And so I'm not saying it's not bad in theory, I'm saying it's bad in practice, uh, that the legal system has great uh, uh, difficulty assessing the full range of costs and benefits that would be necessary, I think, for the enterprise to succeed by its own terms. Um, instead, I, I think that uh, what we've seen over the last two decades is a consistent neglect of a uh, huge number uh, of uh, costs, uh, things like quality effects, uh, dynamic uh, benefits, and so forth. Um, other things were mentioned, labor market, political considerations, all of which uh, might be uh, considered important, all of which are exceptionally div difficult to, to measure, and all of which have, uh, in some ways, made the soul of, of the antitrust law um, uh, resemble the joke about the economist and, and the uh, uh, the economist in the street light, which uh, would be very funny if it wasn't actually so tragic. Um, so, uh, looking back, I think that if you think about consumer welfare standard, it was I think very effective uh, as uh, a standard for measuring the harms of price collusion. Um, but I think I, it was allowed to migrate too far from the natural home. Uh, I don't think it performs well uh, in measuring the harms when it comes to collusive uh, exclusion or parallel exclusion. I don't think it does well with unilateral exclusion. And I think it uh, probably is worse suited to merger review. So, you know, those are important areas of uh, antitrust practice, and I don't think the standard uh, does well in those areas. Um, and let me just give you one example from the exclusion uh, area. Um, so I think uh, most of us can agree uh, the most uh, important Section 2 case uh, over the last uh, several decades was, was the Microsoft uh, case. And um, we look carefully uh, at the Microsoft case, obviously uh, involved uh, uh, Microsoft's uh, exclusion of uh, Netscape, its uh, competitor. On an earlier panel, which I was on, uh, Doug uh, Melamed uh, mentioned that uh, when they began the case, they didn't have uh, particularly evidence of price effects, particular evidence of, uh, of innovation harms. Um, and in some ways, the, the uh, government caught a break uh, because when you look carefully at the case, it accepted that harm to the competitive process uh, was sufficient and sort of implied that that would be harm to consumers. I think today there's a real danger if you brought the Microsoft case today that you would end up in a situation which uh, is too often, I think, the, the consequence of the consumer welfare standard is it all becomes about whether you can prove a concrete price effect uh, on uh, to consumers, whether... Uh, there is evidence of, of harm measured by prices uh, uh, to consumers. Uh, 
And so I think today um, it's very possible the Microsoft case would be thrown out on, on the a theory that uh, the government had failed to demonstrate that Microsoft had uh, concretely demonstrated uh, consumer harm. Now, some people might say, oh, this shows how, how flexible it is and you know, consumer welfare works because we did do the Microsoft case, but I think it was saved by the D.C. Circuit's uh, willingness to basically equate a competitive process standard and a consumer, uh, consumer harm standard. And so this is what I think is, a, and I've mentioned this, but this is what I think, ha at its best, the consumer welfare standard uh, becomes the process of competition standard. It, it's, uh, the two become one through the, through the implication I just described. At its worst, it puts a burden on the plaintiff or on the government uh, in every single case uh, to prove some kind of price effect on consumers. And, uh, uh, and without that, uh, uh, we'll dismiss the case. And also without that, we'll make an agency unwilling to go forward with the case it thinks it might lose. So this is what I think is how it has damaged the, uh, the antitrust law. I also think that, that focus, as I'll discuss later, uh, has tended to hurt the development of the rules and standards that should be the byproduct of, of, of antitrust jurisprudence and um, has weakened the jurisprudence, making every single case kind of coyoxic, one by one, search for can we prove that this costs the consumers a couple bucks or not. And I think that is a, 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 damaging, uh, a damaging tendency for, for the antitrust laws. So uh, why do I think a, a, consumer, a, a competitive process standard, or how do I think a competitive process standard uh, would work? Um, so let me uh, uh, say that, as others have said, that the, a competitive process standard is already in, in the law. It is, frankly, a return to what uh, is sometimes already used by courts and has been used by courts not here for decades, but you know, for, for more than a century. And I think it uh, posits a, a basic question which, in practice, enforcers face. So here you are, you're sitting in the agency, and um, someone comes and complains about conduct. Um, and you know, it could be, it could be uh, uh, multiple parties, it could be single party, whatever it is, there's a complaint about conduct. And the question that the enforcer, I think, needs to be asking, and, and frankly is often asking, is whether these uh, uh, complained of uh, conduct, whether these uh, disruptions are part of the competitive process or a disruption of the competitive process. That's essentially what Brandeis is saying in Chicago Board of Trade opinion, and I could quote it, whether it promotes competition or whether it's such as may suppress or even destroy competition. I don't think you can get far away from that question, and I think the consumer welfare standard has taken us away from that basic question as to whether you're promoting or destroying the competitive process towards this, as I said, quioxic search for uh, even more an esoteric theories of harm. Um, in some ways, at the risk of abusing metaphor, I think that uh, uh, the enforcers are and should be in the position, not unlike a sports referee, uh, in a football game or, or a soccer game, be a little more European about it, and um, you know you have uh, in 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 the course of these games obviously a series of maneuvers, tackles, uh, purported fouls, and in every uh, you know what the what the referee needs to figure out is whether that was uh, actually part of the competition, a legal tackle like in football, or whether it was something that interferes or tends to destroy competition, you know holding penalties, pass interference, and so forth. Um, so that the, the competition itself gets destroyed. And I don't know if you can get much better uh, than having the enforcer in that, in, in that position. The idea of trying to maximize consumer welfare is, frankly, a much more ambitious idea. <laughs> you know, you're sort of asking the enforcer to kind of imagine, think about welfare, a very broad idea, almost a central planning kind of model, and imagine all the things that might come into this and say, well, this, uh, this isn't good or isn't bad for consumer welfare. To, to, to return to the sports referee, so the referee is just calling. Is that a foul that's hurting competition, or is that part of competition? Um, if the referee was then asked whether the foul in question was injurious uh, to the fans, i.e., the consumers of the game, uh, in er each and every instance, uh, you'd have a completely different, almost an absurd uh, standard. But somehow that is where we've ended up, in sort of a case-by-case -case review of each individual foul as to whether it has harmed consumers, when really I think what we should be concerned about uh, is, the, is the competitive uh, process. So I, I think that's, um, that is the direction we should move. I think it is uh, much more realistic. I think it is uh, in line with what people in enforcement agencies 
are already doing anyways. And I want to close by saying that this, uh, the competitive process approach, I think, um, ultimately will, you know, in previous times did, and ultimately will continue to create a healthy common law jurisprudence of what is fair and foul in the conduct of competition. And what we're aiming for ultimately is competition on the merits. You know, you want to stream off the, the things that are abusive competition and leave companies in a position where they're actually uh, competing on the merits. So thank you very much. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Tim, and thank very much to our presenters. Um, I'd like to invite uh, our commentators and panelists to come up and join us right now. Um, uh, as they come up, I'll just briefly introduce them. Again, uh, a, a group of people who probably need ra rather little uh, introduction uh, to this group, but we have uh, Tim Brennan, uh, who has served in numerous positions uh, in g government. That's fine. Uh, in government and is a professor of public policy at University of Maryland uh, at Baltimore County. Uh, to his left, uh, uh, at least in the seating arrangement, is Deb Garza, uh, partner at Covington and Burling, uh, former uh, acting assistant attorney general and deputy assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice. Um, after that is Gene Kimmelman, and if Barry doesn't want to be a director, Gene seems to want to be a president and CEO. He is president and CEO of public, uh, public knowledge. Um, uh, and uh, to his left, we have Sheris posen Sheris, uh, who was also Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, at the Antitrust Division um, and is currently Vice President um, for uh, Antitrust and Global Competition at General Electric. Finally, Fiona Scott Morton, uh, former uh, Economics Deputy at the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice and Professor of Economics at the Yale School of Management. And uh, I'd like to uh, start our commentators off just in the order in which they're seated and uh, invite Tim to come up and present his, his slides. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And the reason I'm up here is because I actually had like three slides to try to move myself along. So let me see if this works. Okay. Um, uh, I wrote a paper in the Antitrust Bulletin a while back on this subject, not that, that long ago, on this subject. And the, one of the things I said, if you sort of pull your thumb out of the consumer, out of the dike here, that, that there's a lot of things that can be introduced. Um, and, and I listed these because I actually had like sites for all of them. This isn't just something I sort of made up. You know, someone once came to my office and asked, what, where's this, in my at Resources for the Future, and asked what happened to sustainable antitrust. So, so the, you know, these things are also out there. Um, I would just mention, be, be, um, because of uh, Sharon on the panel, that, uh, that on the media veracity thing, that's not just a 2016 campaign issue. I had some people come up to me back when GE bought NBC saying that merger should be blocked because now NBC is not going to cover defense contracting anymore. So, so you know, there's a lot of stuff that's around on this. Um, next, in my, my views on this are more pragmatic than they are really philosophical. Um, on CSRF concerns. First, this is uh, the great Fred Gwynn from the even greater My Cousin Vinny. And this is up here to kind of symbolize the question, um, you know, how are judges supposed to do all this balancing of all the things we've heard about uh, today? Um, and for that matter, enforcers, business people, others on this. Um, that's uh, Errol Pegas, who's the uh, sort of the founder or, or a big leader in developing the econometrics behind murder simulations. And that sort of symbolized the, or indicate the question of, isn't antitrust already complicated enough? And, you know, so I actually have some sympathy with some, what Maurice has said in other contexts about whether we should have more presumptions and, and lessons even, you know, with consumer welfare. But if you're going to go this, this thing, it's going to become even more complicated. Now, a slide that got something that got lost in translation here, transmission somehow, was the next picture was going to be one of the earned income tax credit. And that's there because almost all of the other issues, so I'll come back to the competitive process in a moment, that have been identified that things that the antitrust should worry about are economy-wide. And for almost all of those, there are better solutions than antitrust enforcement to try to deal with them. And the last is this picture of Thurman Arnold. Um, and that sort of symbolized the idea that you know, static efficiency, consumer welfare, that may be kind of boring, but if you have the antitrust division do uh, and it, the FTC work, worry about other things, who's going to worry about that stuff? Where are you going to handle it? Okay, so that's that. Last slide. 
just four things just to leave in mind. Um, uh, the first is, uh, would adding social policies put antitrust on the radar screen in a helpful way? Um, one of the things that I've liked hanging around antitrust for all this time is that it's kind of under the radar. And when it's under the radar, it gets to be kind of intellectual, kind of apolitical, all those sorts of things. And I'm not sure if antitrust is viewed as sort of this great social improver that is going to stay that way. Um, the second is, and this is kind of borrowed from some things I've been reading from Greg Worden lately, which is whether the competitive process is an additional principle or a constraining principle on consumer welfare, which is that we always care about consumer welfare. Antitrust cares about it only in the competitive process context. We'll leave other consumer welfare context to other agencies and other laws. Um, the last is whether, or the second next to last is whether this is really about um, Alternative consumer welfare are about whether kind of expanding the reach of antitrust, I think, is a fair question. Things like no-fault monopolization, for example. Um, and one can talk about that. Again, my concerns about that are more actually pragmatic than, in some sense, matters of deep principle. And the last of these is, I'll call this a plea, which is, if you care about these other social goals, please don't waste your time on antitrust. You know, if you care about income inequality, if you care about jobs, if you care about environmental protection, if you care about all those other things, don't waste your time doing this. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Tim, for those uh, uh, very thoughtful and provocative uh, remarks. Um, Deb, I'd like to turn it to you. Okay. Can we reset the time so I can keep track of myself here? Oh, it's okay. oh, it's Tim. Well, I'm, I'm not taking from your time. Okay. All right. So, so look, um, and I don't have slides, so I'm going to remain comfortably seated. Um, I think it's important for antitrust enforcement to be guided by predictable, administrable, principled standards that don't vary from administration to administration or with every political wind. And that has been the key strength, I think, of our antitrust policy. And the body of case law that has developed around and given content to the consumer welfare standard, I think, has done a good job of meeting those objectives of predictability, administrability, and, and principal standards. Now, I, I do think it's important that we continually assess the performance of antitrust enforcement and whether we are achieving the right results. I was part of such an effort as chair of the Antitrust Modernization Commission that looked at these issues, including the consumer welfare standard from 2004 to 2007, and I'm a fan of these hearings. But I think that our assessments have to have a strong empirical foundation. Uh, and I don't believe that the case has been made for repudiating the consumer welfare standard or for any better replacement standard. More pointedly, I think it would be a very large mistake to repudiate the consumer welfare standard or to try to transform the antitrust laws into a cure-all for every perceived social ill. Um, with due respect, I don't think the presenters today have identified a single case wrongly decided because of the consumer welfare standard. Do you want us to get on that? Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and, more, and, and, actually, and, and actually, Tim, Tim I want to thank you because you helped me make that point. Uh, because you talk about the Microsoft case, and I think it actually disproves the thesis. You acknowledge that some might argue, that Doug Mell might argue, that the D.C. Circuit's opinion proved that the consumer welfare standard is sufficiently flexible to protect competition, including where the focus is now price effects. And I would say the same. I, I would say that it does because it, it, it does. It, it's, it's strange to me to use a case that came out right as proof that there's a risk of it coming out wrong. And I think it's important to remember, because you might get the idea of think, listening to the first four presenters, that antitrust decisions are politically driven, that it's an R or a D thing. But in fact, the Microsoft case continued on under two administrations, one Democrat, one Republican. And then look at the court. On the court, four of the seven judges were appointed by Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush, Doug Ginsburg, Steve Williams, uh, Dave Santel, Raymond Randolph, all Republican appointees, all, frankly, people who, if you, if you look back, and particularly at uh, Ginsburg, all believed in the consumer welfare standard. But, as you say, you feel, you feel comfortable with, the, with that Microsoft decision, which, to Maurice's point, did talk about the competitive process. Um, so I think it is helpful to pause on that case, which you chose to emphasize, because I think it does make the point. My concern is that some of the critiques of the consumer welfare standard are a little bit too abstract and rest on a caricature of what the courts have done. 
um, with that standard in place. And I'd like to just go back, and, and there's a couple of uh, cases that I pulled up while I was listening to you. Uh, for example, 1958, Northern Pacific Railway. The Sherman Act was designed to be a comprehensive charter of economic liberty and of preserving free and unfettered competition as a rule of trade. It rests on the premise that the unrestrained interaction of competitive forces will yield the best allocation of our economic resources, the lowest prices, the highest quality, and the greatest material progress, while at the same time providing an environment conducive to the preservation of our democratic, political, and social institutions. That has been a bedrock principle that you will find in, in, in the antitrust division, Justice Department statements of policy going way back, going back, in, because I know because I was there when it was written, to the Reagan administration. And finally, I have one minute, so I will jump to why I say I think it's particularly dangerous uh, to throw away the consumer welfare standard uh, without a good replacement. And one of the things that I pick up on, uh, I think it was Barry who talked about the, the 1984 merger guidelines as being a sort of a signal uh, of, the, of the, what he thinks is wrong with consumer welfare standard. Well, I happened to have been at the antitrust division at the time that we did those merger guidelines, and I will tell you that antitrust enforcement was under a, a lot of pressure at the time for people who were concerned that it wasn't being applied in a smart way that was aware of how markets operated and in a way that was preventing you know, steel industry, other industries, from being able to compete in, in, a, in the world marketplace. We didn't so much change what the enforcement approach, but we changed the articulation of it. And I actually think that the consumer welfare standard saved antitrust, because I think that antitrust was losing its legitimacy, was losing the consensus that has supported strong antitrust enforcement since then. And finally, with my remaining time, um, administrations going way back, including in shares, can testify to this in the, in the Democratic with Christine Barney, for example, during the Obama administration, in prior, prior Republican administrations uh, uh, today, it, we have made great efforts to try to convince the rest of the world that the consumer welfare standard is a good principle in which to build competition law. And I think that that has helped us to, pr to convince other countries about the importance of preserving competitive markets. So my concern is that throwing away the consumer welfare standard is going to do much more good, uh, much more harm rather than any good it could. Thank you very much, Deb. Gene. Thank you, Howard. Um, so my head's hurting trying to figure out how to address this. <laughs> um, so just I'm going to run down a list of a few things really quickly just to try to get back at it. Um, um, you know, I love um, a bunch of various quotes um, um, from Brandeis and others. Um, and then it m immediately makes me think of some quotes from Supreme Court cases that are the current law that are diametrically opposite to what Barry was saying. And I'm just trying to figure out how to be practical here because um, Louis Brandeis isn't on the court. None of the justices resemble Louis Brandeis. None of the people going on the Court of Appeals now look anything like that or think anything like that. The district, it's just not our world, and it's not the jurisprudence as interpreted. So I want to come back to the idea of legislation in a minute. Um, so how to, how to do, make something productive out of this, what I keep hearing is that we're really about the competitive process in most, in most instances. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to get at the framing of a standard. Um, whether you call it consumer welfare or you try to adjust the, the name of it, um, what I keep hearing from everyone is there is enough confusion around how it's being applied that we ought to look at that more carefully. I think that's a fair thing to do. Um, I actually think the way to do this is to put it in front of Congress, because the question is, would Congress pass the Sherman Act today if it were before Congress? Or would it look like something different? We ought to have that public debate because what we're doing is we're talking about a balancing of values that is, um, in, in the digital economy, maybe is worth rejiggering or thinking more carefully about where the burdens lie, what the presumptions are. I think that that would all be extremely productive. Um, and appropriately before Congress because this is a set of policy trade-offs. Um, uh, even if you were to try to think about moving away from a consumer framework, um, I'll give you one 
one example from my experience that I think is extremely relevant here. This isn't about exactly what the courts say only. It isn't about what the enforcers say only. Um, I cut my teeth on the AT&T breakup coming out of law school. And uh, I have to tell you that I believe it's easy to say that that case emanated from the failure of regulation and the need for the Justice Department to step in. But I do not believe that that breakup, one of the probably the most significant antitrust interventions in modern time, would have survived more than a few years if there had not been regulation in place. Because on the, before the ink was dry on the pen, uh, from the pen of, of Judge Green, uh, there was a proposed $20 billion set of rate increases across the country. And without regulation, uh, Congress would not have stood for that for a minute. So my point is it's, it is about the consumer on some level. It is about looking at consumer harm somewhere in the process. I don't think you can disregard that, whether or not it's what you call the standard. Um, antitrust law will not survive if the benefits don't derive to the consumer, consuming public. So from all this, what I take from the various presentations is there's a lot of cleanup that needs to be done, a lot of need to focus enforcement practices, clarity in enforcement practices, and I would say, from my perspective, aggressively pushing the courts to go to the limits, but not go beyond the limits of what antitrust can, can uh, handle um, effectively. But antitrust is not the only tool of competition policy, let alone labor policy or uh, social, social welfare type policies. Uh, we have sector-specific legislation across almost every sector of this country that deals with ways to both promote competition and promote other values. I think we need to align those with antitrust, and I think it's as much a role of the antitrust enforcers to help those agencies figure out how to work closely with strong antitrust enforcement. The one sector we do not have that that I think we need to confront is the tech sector. Um, it doesn't have that history of sector-specific regulation. We have a lot of questions being raised, um, both vertical, horizontal, potential competition. Uh, Maurice raises data. It's an important factor. I think we need to look carefully and say, what, if anything, should there be a public accountability that goes beyond antitrust in that sector? I think that would be the productive way of taking all the good ideas that have been presented and framing it into the right policy debate uh, for our society to address in the digital economy. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I'd like to turn to Shara Spencer. Sure. And um, I, I, I'm with Jean, trying to think about how to frame this and, and feeling the ghost of Judge Bork, you know, who died in 2012 and wrote the antitrust paradox in, in 1978 as sort of the antitrust boogeyman in both Steve Salb's presentation and the presentation here today. I find astonishing because you know a lot has gone on since then, a lot of development of antitrust uh, and antitrust jurisprudence and economics uh, has gone on since then, but uh, I'll leave that for, for another day. So I, I look at this through the lens. I sit here today as the vice president of General Electric, but I also, as a former enforcer, I started my career in uh, competition and in consumer affairs, answering the hotline in the Missouri Attorney General's office where consumers would call with their concerns. And so I feel like I have spent a good portion of my career concerned about consumers, thinking about consumers, starting at the Federal Trade Commission as a staff attorney, working in private practice, and then at DOJ, uh, like Deb as a deputy, and then in the chair um, as the acting AAG. I really do, as I said earlier, welcome these debates. I think this kind of exchange uh, forces us to figure out where, where we sit on the sides of of these issues and the various alternatives that have been presented today. I think the FTC sort of letting a thousand flowers bloom in analyzing these is important as well. Um, but I continue to believe that consumers need to remain at the center of the analysis, and I'm very concerned that some of the presentations we had today takes us far away from that. Um, you know, I, I actually think that um, we might be seeing folks who aren't as concerned about the competitive process or consumers, but instead perhaps a political agenda. So why do I defend the use of the consumer welfare standard, you know, whatever name we call it, because I would suggest that what Tim Wu has articulated is incorporated into the consumer welfare uh, standard. The competitive process is part of that today and has been part of that. 
we have, as Deb said, we have a collection of robust jurisprudence in law enforcement, hard and soft law that we can rely upon. It guides businesses like General Electric, enforcement agencies, and consumers. The backbone of that collection of jurisprudence is economics and economic analysis. Um, and I believe that consumers benefit from competition. I believe in competition. I also believe in vigorous enforcement of the antitrust laws because I think consumers benefit from lower prices, more choices, and innovation. And I think competition derives that. And I think good competition enforcement allows that to continue going forward. Um, you know, businesses strive to deliver better products at lower costs. Uh, and I think that's all part of the economic analysis and learning that underline our, underlie our consumer welfare standard. Um, so when I think about what's wrong with, there's nothing wrong with discussing it, but what's wrong with shifting this, you know, to some of the other uh, analyses that have been presented today. So, um, you know, should we be thinking about fairness, for example? Should we be taking into account externalities like harms to workers or the environment? Um, it, it all really sounds great um, to, to take those into account. But again, I think the unintended consequences of doing so far outweighs the benefits. So first, I think there's a level of subjectivity that's added to the evaluation of a merger or conduct, and that would be un un intolerable and the uncertainty that would provide. How would I advise GE to comply with the laws um, when there's that much sub subjectivity if we were to use a fairness standard or evaluating uh, externalities? I think that turns to standards that are in the eye of the beholder. If someone who follows the beliefs of Ayn Rand is sitting at one of the agencies uh, versus one of our you know, colleagues today that are sitting at the agencies, I think it would um, you know, cause a variance uh, and I think cause enough confusion and uncertainty. Deb certainly touched upon that. I don't know that we have to, you know, how do you define what is fair? How do you define you know, those issues? Second, I think it ignores some political realities, as Jean pointed out, you know, in terms of our judges today, uh, you know, they're, they're, we, we, it's the reality that we face. And there are a lot of people that decry a lot of the murders that have been cleared, you know, Amazon, Whole Foods, Instagram, Facebook, and Google's a, 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 you know, acquisitions. Um, as we talked about before, I think thinking about those courts and what will happen in those courts, and if you lose a case, and what the case law that comes out of that will mean to the rest of the enforcement agenda, whether it's private plaintiffs or state AGs or the federal agencies, is important. Uh, case selection, as we talked about in the last panel, is to me critically important. Also, when I sat in the chair at DOJ, I saw how the political process can work and work to your disadvantage. We did the ag hearings. We looked at agriculture closely. We worked with the Department of Agriculture. But in fact, we ran into an incredible buzzsaw because the industry rose up. Congress, re Congress threatened the DOJ budget and said, we're going to shut down your budget, so we're going to shut down all enforcement if you continue with this, and actually prohibited the Department of Agriculture from working with us on these issues. So there's a political reality that you have to take into account that I think has to be weighed into the balance, you know, added into the balance. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Sheris. Uh, and Fiona. All right. Since I'm last, I'm going to try to synthesize a little bit. Uh, my feeling about this debate on consumer welfare, the consumer welfare standard, is that it's a little bit of a red herring. So the consumer welfare standard was, I think, over the last 30 years, redefined by defendants who are profit maximizing and want to be allowed to merge with whoever they want and exclude whoever they want. And we would expect that. And the goal of those kinds of parties is to raise the burden to the plaintiffs and try to convince the courts that plaintiffs have to achieve very specific uh, but-for world estimates of prices and products that would have been invented if uh, the merger were allowed to go through and so on. And one impact of that high burden of proof has been a big emphasis on price because economists have, for various reasons, moved further on price than, say, our studies of innovation. So we end up with the street map problem that Tim uh, highlighted. So then that standard succeeds, that redefinition of consumer welfare uh, succeeds in influencing the courts. Now we have the left wing attacking that thing. Okay, that's not the consumer welfare standard. That's false, that that's the consumer welfare standard. However, it's true that that thing, uh, the alternative uh, de you know, defendant-friendly standard, has not worked. Okay, so the left wing is quite correct that what we have 
is a situation with uh, insufficient, I think, antitrust enforcement, rising problems with uh, competition, rising markups, declining labor share, problems with uh, very static uh, market structure because entry is harder and so forth. Okay, uh, now, do we fix this by including other values like literacy, democracy, and whatnot in the standard? I think Sharis has been eloquent about that. Deb has been eloquent about that. Uh, likewise, Tim, uh, I think Gene's right. If you want literacy and democracy, you get a regulatory agency to do that, and you don't ask uh, an antitrust judge to do that. So how would we actually fix the consumer welfare standard to go back to the thing that we actually intended in the first place? Um, we've seen these harms accumulate since 1980. We need to get the balance of the costs of under-enforcement, so monopoly prices and harms from lack of innovation and so on, to balance the costs of over-enforcement, not as much innovation on ways to do things online, whatever. So I think there's a lot of evidence to say, as I said before, that we need to be a little bit more aggressive. How should we change? Uh, some of the things that have come up today are ideas like, let's focus on the competitive process. I think that's extremely helpful because a world in which uh, an expert witness is said, tell to me the exact counterfactual that would have occurred if this dominant platform had not excluded this small entrant. How quickly would the entrant have grown? How, what products would the entrant have brought out? What prices would the entrant be charging? Okay. Those are really difficult questions to answer when you don't see that world because the entrant was excluded. So it's essentially an impossible standard, but being able to say, well, the entrant was excluded, we have proof of that, and that's all we need to show because we feel that if the entrant's allowed in, the entrant will be doing something useful for the consumer, and that's the way markets work. So I think competitive process is a really good idea. Monopsony, uh, renewed attention on that is a good idea. That's just analogous to monopoly. We know exactly how to analyze that. And a renewed attention to efficiencies to make sure that they're verifiable and merger specific, as was emphasized this morning, and that the standard of proof there is high. We don't just find two random documents. We actually have really some serious analysis about those efficiencies. And the burden of proving those efficiencies is on the defendants because they're the experts in their business and their industry and they understand it. So all of that would be terrific and perhaps we would uh, put those things in a law and uh, have a better law. That's great, but when I look out today, what I see, as Jean uh, pointed out, is I see courts that are reluctant to protect consumers. We look at the Amex decision, and the court's very anxious to protect Amex cardholders, and that seemed to be all. And Amex cardholders, in case you don't know, are not a randomly drawn segment of the population. So if those are your set of decision makers and you give them discretion, Okay, you're not going to get an improvement. Give them better laws, but still there has to be clear and convincing evidence, and it's up to a judge to decide what clear and convincing is. So it's not clear to me that you move the ball very much, even if you have a lot better laws. I think there are two options when your decision makers are chosen or, or have been taught uh, to not be protecting consumers. You have the kind of what I'll call the German-style option, and, and maybe um, Morris is, is along these lines. Let's make a long list of things you're not allowed to do, and then if you tick any of those boxes, it's illegal. The other one is to move the discretion to a different set of people. Um, so the consumer welfare standard's fine, discretion is excellent, but we need different judges or a different court or some other setup as a way to run our antitrust laws if we'd like to get answers that are in the best interest of consumers and society. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Fiona. Um, before uh, we, we get some back and forth going amongst the panelists here, uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, there are helpful folks out there with these cards on which you can write your questions uh, for the panelists. So I would encourage you to do so uh, because it would be great to have some time uh, towards the end of the session when we, when we address, uh, when we address uh, your questions. Uh, we already have one asking for uh, uh, divestiture and breakup of a large sports enterprise. Uh, we'll get to that later, um, but uh, I would welcome uh, your questions. Um, this has been a really uh, a fascinating uh, and provocative panel. I think we've, see, we've heard a variety of different viewpoints uh, ranging from really uh, just a fundamental rethinking of what antitrust should be to um, uh, to, I think, a strong defense of the status quo, 
Um, and then in between sort of ways that we can work within the existing framework, uh, maybe restore forgotten aspects of that framework and push harder on, on some existing aspects of that framework. So I think we've got a very, a very broad range, uh, range of viewpoints. And, and I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about where I think the consumer welfare standard comes from just very briefly and then open up a couple of questions uh, for the panel, and I, I will I will direct these questions, but really uh, they can um, uh, they can be answered by any of you. And I'm sure some of our four original presenters may have some rebuttal that they want to slip in there to to, to some <laughs> of the commentary as well. Um, but I think one of the big themes that we've heard on the panel today is how we achieve fairly broad and long-term objectives. I would say heterogeneous broad and long-term objectives through a statute and a set of institutions that effectively set up a reactive case-by-case -case enforcement structure, whether that is public enforcement or private enforcement. So we have these lofty goals of the antitrust laws, I think a, a fair reading of the legislative history and a lot of the early thinking uh, in the courts about the antitrust laws was that they did have broad purposes, that the hope was that by enforcing competition and preventing monopoly, Lots of good things would happen, among them uh, more economic competition, but included among them also a broader distribution and a prevention of monopoly of political power and control over the legislative agenda. So these are broad things that the antitrust laws chose to, uh, to achieve, but of course are very terse statutes that developed through federal common law uh, and that really came about through specific case by case uh, a kind of development. And I think this led to a serious question, which is how do we choose specific and consistent criteria to apply to these specific cases as they arrive that will, over time, continue to achieve these very general, long-term, and I would say potentially conflicting, in a specific case, uh, objectives. And so I view the consumer welfare standard as something of a pragmatic solution or answer to that question. What is the thing we do in the specific case? What is the criteria? What are the criteria? What is the standard that we apply in the specific case that cumulatively over time will seem to work towards achieving these broader statutory objectives that Barry and others, I think, have, have very articulately presented here uh, this afternoon. So in some sense, I view the consumer welfare standard as a method, as a pragmatic means, as a set of criteria, if you will, to apply in the specific case, but not as a philosophical program in and of itself, at least when it uh, arose. And, and I think when, when Deb talked about the 1984 guidelines as being a way to shore up, further define, and rearticulate the consumer welfare standard, I think that that's what it was. I, I felt that that was very much a methodological change as opposed to a philosophical one. But maybe, as often happens, uh, the medium becomes the message, the method becomes the objective, and maybe we've object. May, maybe there, there, there is a point where we have gone too far, and those things that were meant to be specific criteria to achieve broader ends have become the ends in, in, in and of themselves. And so what I, what I have heard is a variety of solutions to try to restore the real objectives and not let what really should have been a set of methodological criteria uh, become right. the objectives themselves. And we've heard a variety of proposals on this panel, uh, ranging from, I think, fairly uh, a radical program of um, rethinking the antitrust laws fundamentally, uh, a more regulatory program, uh, perhaps a, a, a much more uh, sort of rigid set of presumptions to think, but, but all of this comes together, I think, in a way to restore a competitive process or come up with criteria to put in place effective competition. So that leads me to a couple of questions that I want to throw out to the panelists. And I think I might start with you, Maurice, because um, you, really, you, prevent, you, you present what I view as uh, something that's aimed to be a pra another pragmatic solution, which is, Let's go from consumer welfare, which has spilled over into this too narrow set of objectives itself, and let's bring, come back to a methodological solution called effective competition. So when I think about that, though, I have to know what competition is. 
So uh, my, my, my first question to you and then to the panelists is, what is competition? Because I think that also gets to the competitive process question. But then when you start to talk about counting to four or other kinds of solutions that, how do we get to that number? How do we know that's the right number? Doesn't that require, as Deb, I think, very correctly said, to share us, and I, I think you know, implicit in Fiona's remarks as well, was a rigorous empirical view of what will be good, but then how do we define good? And aren't we just back to the question of what is, what is the relevant mm -hmm. standard? So what is competition, and how do we know when it's enough or effective? What is our, what is, what is our, 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 our metric? Sure. So. Um, I mean, it's a fun, the, the interesting thing is I actually wrote a paper on what is competition, and you would think there would be a uniform definition of competition, and there isn't. There are various conceptions of competition and how competition of, it, um, works in different industries. So what the effect of competition is, you look at to see is what the rivalry, or the competitive dynamics is in that particular industry, and then this is aligned with the incipiency standard would that have a substantial lessening of competition? That's within Section 7 of the Clayton Act. And I think this is actually more realistic. Now, I've heard about how consumers are front and center. That's not true. I mean, you look at radio mergers. The DOJ does not consider the impact of radio mergers on consumers or on listeners. They look like what Tim pointed out, at what's quantifiable. They look purely on advertisers and the like. So what we would look at is what is the competitive process and what is the threat to the competitive process? And I think this is where the Supreme Court, before the whole consumer welfare, would look at what the um, legislative history desired, what were the particular evils that the legislature was aimed, and if you look at, like, the Clores decision, there you didn't have to show necessarily what the impact was on consumer prices. You didn't even have to show how the elimination of Clores would necessarily harm consumers. All that the court pointed out is that it would impinge the competitive process. Now, you might come back and say, well, how do we know how much is enough? Granted, we can have that debate. But at least what I'm offering is something far more transparent than what the consumer welfare stand has today, where the court says we're not bound by stare decisis, we're not bound by the legislative aims, that we can base it on our conception of modern economic theory, and it can evolve with new circumstances and new wisdom. So you basically have an untethered Supreme Court through a rule of reason that doesn't necessarily always consider the impact that it has on consumers. Can I go over there? Uh, no, I mean, uh, Howard, I think that's a terrifically important question, and it actually gets at the heart of everything that we do in this room and we do in America. Um, you know, the answer is, like, how do we get to the particular number that's right? Is, you know, one option is that we have experts do it. We get a bunch of economists in a room. We get a bunch of lawyers who have spent the last 30 years, you know, thinking about this in a room. And, and, and then we close the door and you guys come out with a solution and you present it to the public. That's one option. That's actually how we've lived in this country for the last 35 years. You know, uh, Tim made very clear he would like to continue to live that way. He said, I like antitrust being under the radar. Oh, God. No, I, not I, a, not I anymore. Not stand. anymore, Tim. That, that is absolutely not, not true. anymore, Tim. The <laughs> other option, the other option is through public debate. You know, I mean, remember what I said before about what W. E. B. Du Bois said. What is America? It's a vision of democratic self-government, the domination of political life by the intelligent decision of free and self-sustaining men. So we could do the little tiny group of experts self-chosen experts, self-regulated experts, a little association of experts, or we can have all the people involved. Those are the two options. Now, in terms of getting to the number, how do we get to any of these numbers? The people decide. I mean, think about, think, I'll give you an example. Northwest Ordinance, at the very beginning of this country, 
People were just drawing lines in the map. Carl, we'll get to you later. <laughs> <laughs> Northwest Ordinance, drawing lines in the map. You could draw the lines this far apart, you could draw them this far apart. What was the result of the when people got together and drew the different lines? They drew in these different sections, and they made the law, they made the regulation, they made the policy such that each family would end up with about 160 acres, a quarter section. That was a political decision made by the people of the United States working together. One family, 160 acres. Could, there were other people who said, you know what? We give one family a million acres and let them do with it what they will. That actually was in the southern part of the country. Maybe it was only 20,000 acres or 10,000 acres. So we had two different visions. So we can go with the vision in which we give to one family 20,000 acres, an entire state to run, or we can say one family gets 160 acres. That's a decision for the people to make. Can I get it? Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm going to. Well, Sharis, you yeah, I, I just gotta have a couple to bullshit Tim. on that. I'm sorry to use profanity, <laughs> but you know, again, if you've sat in the chair and made the decisions, if you've worked in the agency, if you've striven to take into account consumers, the idea that it's behind some closed door and decisions are magically made. How many consumer groups did I meet with? How many consumers did I talk to? I had consumers <clears throat> calling me on the phone, so I'm just I, I I can't let that statement stand at all. Oh, we can actually talk about right. the connection between General Electric and American well, 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 antitrust right. law, too. I think, I think, I think right. that's getting pretty far so outside I'll, the uh, yep. Well, I'm not gonna, I'll go back to what I was going to talk about, which is, um, <laughs> so, um, no, I want, Howard, I want to draw on your and also Fiona's uh, comments. I, I think it's very important not to discuss consumer welfare standard in theory, you know, what it might be, what it, what it uh, originally was intended to be, but in fact what it is. Uh, today, and I see it, uh, I think it has, as Fiona suggested, uh, primarily evolved into a, a burden on, on plaintiffs and government to, to prove price effects in each and every case, and uh, the absence of, of uh, available price effects uh, is typically not always fatal unless you have an extremely um, uh, compelling alternative economic framework which is hard to find. So that, that is what it's become, a burden on, on cases. And I, I think, um, you know, there are those who I respect. Um, uh, some, many of them in this room who want to sort of uh, fix consumer welfare or, or understand it could be better. And, you know, I respect that, that view, but I think it is tainted. I mean, I think this is where, where it is today. It has become this situation where you're in an agency and you're like, that looks like very anti-competitive conduct. Oh, we don't really have price effects. We can't really, we're not going to be able to do much with this. Um, so, Deborah, you asked if there are any cases I could think of that have um, gone wrong and because of this, uh, I guess I called it fake consumer, whatever, this, this standard we have. Um, here's a few, um, the American Express case, um, the AT&T Time Warner case, uh, Brook Group, the American Air